Greetings and welcome to this week's edition of the Rock County Civics Academy Lesson Plan. The Rock County Civics Academy is a production of Common Sense Reestablished. This LLC was founded by Richard Gruber, Paul Murphy, and Dwayne Severson. CSR is a communications company that provides educational programming on topics of a public interest and is not affiliated with any political party and is committed to common sense based principles as espoused in the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights. Our programs are nonpartisan. That is, we are not affiliated with any organized or even unorganized political party or political movement. This series of presentations is made possible through the support of our growing list of benefactors, including Big Radio, JATV, Public Access Media, Ragnarsoft, Ragnarsoft.com, Have Camera, Wisconsin, Tom Edwards, The Italian House, Havana Coffee on Milton Avenue. Please keep in mind the views expressed are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent the views of our benefactors or the broadcast entities who will be reproducing our content for later public distribution. Good evening and thank you for joining us. This is the first in a series of candidate forums that the Rock County Civics Academy will be presenting over the course of the next few weeks. Um, to mark your calendars going forward on February the 23rd, we'll be hosting a candidate forum in Milton where we'll have the opportunity to interview the candidates for uh, the Milton School District Board of Trustees as well as feature the uh, mayoral race and the council races uh, that will occur in the, in the city of Milton. We've got the real distinct pleasure there of uh, being hosted for that event by the Milton College Preservation Association and will be located at the uh, old chapel in Old Main on the old Milton College campus at uh, I believe it's 150 College Street so mark your calendars and if you have an interest we'd love to see you in the audience there. Tonight uh, we have two forums that we'll be conducting uh, later on this evening beginning at roughly 7 p.m. we'll have a discussion with the candidates for Janesville uh, city Council. Uh, but before we go to the City Council conversation, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome to our group tonight candidates for the Janesville Board of Election, Board of Education Trustees, Carl Dommershausen, to my immediate right, and to my far right, Kevin Murray. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome. Linda, or Lisa Herda was also invited to attend this evening. She declined due to a conflict of interest, as she explained to me. She's, she's doing yeoman's duty, trying to beat off the sunshine on a Caribbean vacation. Um, oh I invited her to submit a statement of introduction, and, and she has not been able to provide that to us. There will be future opportunities, though, for you to quiz her along with these two gentlemen prior to the election, which is coming up here in a, in a few short weeks. So. With that, gentlemen, again, welcome, and, and uh, we'll start off this evening with you, Kevin, if you would, or I'm sorry, we'll start with Carl first. Mm. We'll do this alphabetically. Carl, the role of school board commissioner is ever evolving. How would you define that role, and frankly, how do you approach doing that job? Well, our, our main purpose, of course, is to, if you look at our rules, are to hire and fire the uh, school superintendent. We also look over the budget and that and uh, okay it or make changes to it and have some pretty good discussions on the budget. Uh, we have very professional people handling these things and they do an awful good job. We're real proud of them and that. It makes it easier for us. But beyond that, there really isn't a lot to, to the school board other than being there and uh, taking care and making sure things run smooth. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of problems. And, that, and when they pop up, we usually take care of them quite well. Thanks, Carl. Kevin, the same question. The role of the school board uh, as a commissioner is ever evolving. How would you define your role and how do you approach doing the job? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces and meet some new people. I tell you, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily evolved over time. I remember a gentleman 
who I uh, admire and respect. Bob Collins was on the mm -hmm. school board for, oh, I think 20 years. But, you know, my, the way I view it is I have my own personal uh, life experiences that uh, make me who I am. And, um, but, and that, that helps me create and um, form opinion and, there, and then vote on issues. But primarily, I um, have learned over time that um, the best way to do my service is to make sure I'm out in public and listen to people, what they have to say, what their opinion is, and you get different points of view, particularly based on age. You know, yeah, I even talk to young people at the, at the high schools, what they're thinking about, what they need for school. And of course, different spectrum of taxpayers, those that are a little more conservative or perhaps a little more liberal with what they conceive as spending as it relates to budget. But, and I do that by staying connected with the community. I'm at a fan of coffee shop, I officiate basketball, I volunteer on the Optimist Club, I'm at the threshery selling cheese curds. I'm, I'm easy to find, so thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Let's start with you again on this question, Kevin. What do you see as the top issues facing the school board of trustees, and frankly, how do you intend to, uh, to address those issues? There's two things that I've been thinking about lately. One is our, our state report card and our, our test scores have been uh, not good. Out of 400 and some districts, we've been ranked in the bottom 300. And uh, the last couple years, uh, we've set our goals and priorities at uh, math and reading and getting those scores because uh, if you talk to commerce and business, people wanting to move to town, even individual families, they want to know how your schools are doing. Then, and then, of course, it's right, the budget. Um, costs don't go down, but we want to maintain programming at the same time. So how do we best manage that? And I think we've already taken one great step, and I was so proud of administration, and this could be controversial, but our, our um, charter school, Tigel School, was having declining enrollment, attendance was, was not good, and the test scores were decreasing. So at a time, we had to make a tough decision to cut some program <clears throat> for numbers of reasons, and I'd like to see a little bit more of that before we start asking the public again for some more referendum money. Thank you, Kevin. Car Carl, what do you see as the top issues facing the school board of trustees, and how do you intend to, how do you intend to address those issues going forward? I agree with Kevin. Uh, test scores are extremely important uh, on what we can do in that. But at the same time, it's just a snapshot in time. In other words, you can do the test the next week and it'll be different. But you have to start somewhere for guidelines on what you're doing. Um, we could probably do better as most school districts could if we had more people there to work with the children. Uh, that large classrooms are not good. And that's a problem we have where we, the aides, we don't have the money. And that's what it comes down to. We keep asking the local taxpayers to pay for it. And we have to start waking up and start paying for it at the state level. It's mandated in the state constitution that it will be furnished and certain amounts will be taken care of. And we don't get that. When I came on the board the first two years, now that's going only 30 seconds, so I'll just kind of cool it there. Mm -hmm. But uh, money is, I don't want to say the root of all evil, the lack of money is. We shouldn't ask our local people to take care of it. When it's taken care of, they've already paid into it. And that, but we have no choice. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Carl, this is for you again. What in your life experiences best prepared you for the job of a school board trustee? It's a good question. Uh, I think just being out into the community in many ways, I get a lot of input. Uh, a variety of things. Uh, I'm, my business is retired, but I still work part-time at a quick trip. And I watch the children come in there. I watch them come in with their parents. I hear them 
and I see what we need. Uh, this is a current ex experience. I went to school in Janesville, I'm a lifetime resident, and I know what happened then. Schools have changed. Uh, I can't tell you what the underlying thing of the change is because I didn't see it back then when I was in school. Uh, but today I see a lot of things differently. I think my background of being in many things has helped a tremendous amount uh, in the community and talking to many people. So what, what beyond that, I don't know, I think I do a good job and that's what counts in that. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Kevin, what in your life experience has best prepared you for the job of a school board trustee? First, thanks for repeating the question because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> what in your lifetime right, has best right. prepared you? So, you know, I was thinking uh, as a high school student, I was okay, but I uh, enlisted in the Air Force. And I remember waiting in line to go to Chow, and I was screwing around in the back because you, they, by height, they put you in, and you were in the back row, and the drill instructor just grabbed me out of nowhere and just. So that was a good experience, you know, um, to not screw around so much, you know, and, and pay attention to what you're supposed to be doing. But as a young person, that really was a great experience being in the, in the service. I, you know, another thing about, I'm thinking about uh, was how important local politics is to me. Um, so I got hired uh, at the fire department in 1980. And at that time, there was some financial stress at the city level and they were gonna lay off uh, several of us firefighters, and I was one of them. I just had a, I got married, had a kid, came back to Janesville, this is where I'm from, and they were gonna lay me off. And the firefighters, all of them, young and old, uh, was at the city council meeting and helped and lobbied the city council and saved my job by one vote. So, Local politics has been ever, forever uh, uh, important to me. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, remind you again, we will have, we will be following the the timer, and, <laughs> and we'll give you advance warning. But when we do get the red card, that means we've hit the red card, and, and we'll move on from there. Uh, Kevin, this question is for you. School boards across the country have faced unprecedented governance challenges during the recently concluded public health pandemic. Mm -hmm. What's the most important lesson you learned as a board trustee during those times? And how will you apply that uh, to your efforts going forward? That's a great, great question. <clears throat> of all the negative things that we could talk about, about the COVID years, we've, we've learned what we can do differently in the school district that will, has changed the way we can educate our students. One is virtually. So used to be, you know, dating myself, when you call in sick to school, you could get your work, but now you can do it virtually if, you, if we needed to. So that's another, a, a, a good thing that's coming out of those COVID situations. Um, so being able to connect with teachers, the staff in a school district, is no longer dedicated by having to be in person anymore. So those are some great things that we're, we're, we're learning through. And the fact that the community came together to help you know, the students still thrive and be educated and um, be able to have extracurricular activities at the same time are, um, you know, I try to look at that, those experiences as positive. Thanks, Kevin. Carl, school boards across the country have faced unprecedented governance challenges during the recently concluded public health pandemic. What is the most important lesson you learned as a board trustee during those times, and how will you apply what you learned going forward? Well, I think, like Kevin, we, we learned we can do things differently. We didn't have to do everything in the same manner that we did. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. 
but we did find out there's other ways of delivering education. I think that's, that's very important. Uh, we were very fortunate in Janesville, well, at least the school board was, we didn't get what other boards across the country got in communities. There was no hatred. There was collaboration. We worked together. Uh, people were understanding. There were people that were angry, and I understand. We all have differences of opinion. We all have different children that react differently. And uh, I, think, I think it went fairly well. Did it affect our grades? Probably, because it did across the state and that. Uh, as we were rising, it's no fun to be falling. So we're going to work harder on that and that type of thing. But I think the community, for not threatening us like others have, trying to come in and uh, as individuals, as administration or anything, the community was good. And we'll, I'll say positive and I enjoy it and I know the other board members feel the same. Thank you. Carl again. Community and school board engagement became a really important balancing act during the pandemic. What did you learn from that experience and how we apply that newly acquired knowledge into your community engagement activities? Well my community engagement uh, activities aren't as strong as they used to be. Uh, I was one of those that wore a mask continuously, even at work, and that. Um, it didn't slow me down or anything. I shopped, I did all the things that were necessary. I just took what I felt were the necessary precautions. Others did what they felt they had to do. Uh, most people masked up, but it didn't mean you were wrong because you didn't. It just meant that that was right for me. Uh, I belong on a couple other boards yet, and uh, we went virtual on those. So that worked out very well. I think the board level being virtual is a different animal than being virtual at the classroom level <clears throat> and that uh, as such. So yeah, I didn't really change much at all during that time in my activities. I just moved on and tried to get things done as best I could, and I listened to people and what they said and had discussions. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, community and school board engagement became an important balancing act during the pandemic. What did you learn from that experience and how we apply that newly acquired knowledge into your community engagement activities? So I, I guess when I'm thinking back to that, the experience of those COVID years of how how much of an emotional issue that was and it brought the public out in in numbers on both sides of the debate and as a board member you know it's taken me time to learn how to manage my emotions and my own personal feelings in particular when somebody's addressing you and they're really angry, and they're looking at you like they don't like you, and it's it's a tough thing to manage personally. But what I find interesting, what I'm thinking about now, is though, as I you know, I see my pal Dwayne Severson behind the camera there, and my <coughs> friend Tom Bryan was on council for years, is that we had by far more people at the COVID open meetings or any in particular any emotional issue at a budget hearing we might have one person there so it, it's a interesting dynamic humans when we have these board meetings and open sessions and how emotional it can get we've tried forums at excuse me at schools um, at the library we have open sessions and such, but the best way is face-to-face -face in the community. Thanks, Kevin. I'd mentioned to the audience that uh, if you have questions that you would like to address to the candidates, we will definitely make room within the evening festivities to, to have those questions uh, uh, offered for response. So there should be a sheet of paper 
uh, or a small card near your chair, or you can go back to the registration table and pick one up. If you have questions, uh, either Paul Murphy or Dwayne will, will gather them, just raise your hand, and he'll bring them up here. And I will try my best to see if we can fit as many of those in tonight as, as is humanly possible in the time, time constraints we're operating within. So thank you. Um, Kevin, this is for you. In your recent experience, what is one thing the school board has done really well and should be celebrated? Oh, my goodness. One thing. Um, okay. The thing that comes to my mind is the creative thinking and community support, in particular, individual support on our new Parker Arts Academy at Parker High School. Um, it's been a successful program for the arts, music, and theater. Um, it's a type of thing that not only lets our young people specialize in those particular things, but uh, engage with other, other children, work on those social skills and good communication skills, and even if at that level you're participating in um, producing the props in the, in the stage, um, what do they call them? Staging. Um, engages children and students that might encourage them to continue to come to school because they found an interest and helps them excel in other things. So that's one thing recently that um, I think it's been a very great success. And if you've been to any of the plays, you know how wonderful they are. In fact, if you're a senior, which looks like most people are, you can get in free. You go downtown and get a senior pass. You can get into athletic events and uh, uh, plays for free. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Carl, same question. In your recent experience, what is one thing the school board has done really well and should be celebrated? Well, I think the school board has done a good job on hiring superintendents. They seem to be the right superintendents for the moment, and that's important. Uh, during my time, uh, we had Dr. Schulte, and she did what was necessary during the drastic budget cuts we had to undergo. Uh, that, and Duane and others will remember that. We had some lively discussions, and. We ended up good out of it in that uh, as such. The next one was Steve, what was Steve's last name? I can't remember. Poofall. <laughs> Poofall. Uh, he was the one that was there working with the children and getting grades up, and then the pandemic hit, and he handled that very well. And I'm very proud of our new one, uh, new superintendent. I think he's going to do well. So I think we've done our homework, we've followed through on them. They seem to be the right person for the right time. And most organizations, I don't want to say most, but many organizations cannot say that about who, what happened. We all can make mistakes, but I thought we worked together on picking our superintendents in that. So that's, that's what I'm most proud of. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Conversely, Carl, name one thing where the school board should receive a below average grade and how would you correct that matter? I don't think our board is below average in any way, in anything that they've done. We've had discussions, we've had differences of opinion and that, but we all come together in the end and work with each other. I don't see any negatives to our school board right now. Um, and that if there were negatives, I think you would find more people running for school board which is what's happened in the past. So as of now, I think it's a good school board, and I like every one of them on it. I have most people that were on it in the past. In fact, since I've been on, all the people. So I can't find negatives there. Okay. Kevin, conversely, name one thing where the school board should receive a below average grade, and how would you correct that matter? Well, like I stated earlier, the evidence and data shows we got below average grades in our state report card. Math and reading scores, mm -hmm. they're, they're below. They're, they're, they're well below where we should be for this type of school district and what the community, community expects of a school district. 
and we've, we've taken some real strong uh, corrective measures. And one was when we hired the new superintendent, that was number one on our decision-making tree is we have to do better at our test scores and our state report card. Now we all know just testing and such isn't the holy grail of getting our children the best education, but it's such a, but it's comparable to every other district in the state. And businesses and families look at that data if they want to move here or they want to stay here, or maybe they might want to uh, migrate and take their kids to Milton instead. So that's, this is a very important issue right now, now to, I think, the board in general. And what we have done also is we know we have some wonderful directors, Allison DeGraff and Kim Paramboon and their staff that are wonderful people in that skill. And the, we instructed the, uh, thank That's you. Good. Thank you. I'm going to uh, turn to a couple of questions that are coming in from the audience. And Kevin, I'll start with you. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you personally reviewed the curriculum and materials for all classes? No. Uh, and, and you know, that's, you know, as a board member too, over time you, you, you learn, you know, you can keep your hands on the pulse of some of the issues, but to stick your nose too deep in the operations of what the professionals do, in other words, the teachers and the custodial and maintenance and support staff, that's the job of the directors and the principals and the superintendent to do that. Now, if there's, there's controversial issues that, that bubble up in the community that they're, we're emotional about and concerned about, you know, without naming those, we, we understand what some of those social issues can be, what we're teaching our children in school, then we may have to pay more attention. Okay. Thank you. Carl, have you personally reviewed the curriculum and materials for all classes? No. The answer is the same as Kevin. We hire a superintendent who picks administrators, which we support and okay, and we go to the uh, teachers. That's their job. Now, if something isn't working, then we have to step up and do something. But right now, it seems to be working, and we hope that it gets better. Okay. Carl, in what ways do PTAs have influence and effect on the school board members and uh, school board agendas? Well, PTAs have uh, having an effect. I think they're a positive effect. They, they make us aware of things uh, that their children experience, that their school experiences, their classrooms. And it helps us to get a little footing on certain things. Uh, they're not negative, they're very positive. And I support them wholeheartedly, but past that, I, I can't think of anything there. Okay, Carl. Kevin, in what ways do PTAs have influence and effect on, on you as a school board member and, and uh, issues that you decide? Currently, I, uh, Elizabeth Paul, She's on the board. She's an active member uh, in PTA. She's got two or three children in the school district. She always has been. So she's been a real good conduit for the PTA. She lets us know <clears throat> what's going on. You know, at one time, uh, the board, the nine of us were taking turns uh, attending PTA meetings, and we haven't done that in a long time. But um, to be honest with you, I rarely hear from any of the PTA organizations. Um, the direct contact, I, I'll be at Jackson School tomorrow morning at 7.30 making popcorn, <laughs> bagging popcorn for their PTA fundraiser, but other than that, I, I really haven't had any, I just don't have much contact with the PTA. I know they're there, but I don't, I don't hear from them directly. I want to paraphrase this next question from the audience and, and see if I can encapsulate it with, with a little bit more conciseness. During the pandemic, there were an awful lot of emotional individuals who, who articulated a lot of concerns in front of school boards across the country, and we saw that here in Janesville. 
Kevin, someone characterized some of those concerned parents as domestic terrorists. Um, how did you feel about that citizen input, positive and negative, as it took place during the pandemic? And have you learned anything from that? Well, you know, uh, o over time on the school board, I've learned that I, you know, there was times I got kind of lost control and get really angry or emotional about some issues. I don't know if Dwayne's ever witnessed that with me or not. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, I officiate high school basketball. Every decision I make, half the people don't like it. And sometimes I get yelled at. I get yelled at a lot. And most of the time, not all the time, I, I actually take a few seconds and do a little meditation or, or, or prayer to help me calm down and realize these are just people that are they're upset and emotional and passionate about their issue. I've never felt threatened or never felt like uh, my, my personal safety was in jeopardy. It just, it's just, um, it's a lesson you have to learn when you participate in the community that people are gonna disagree. And I don't, rarely have I met a person that's held a grudge. And a lot of it depends on how I react to that, that person. If I show them respect and just don't give them lip service, you know, it usually works out all right in, in the long run. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, same question for you, Carl. There's been a lot of varying emotions uh, expressed during school board meetings and in other places uh, during the pandemic in particular. Uh, do you think that concerned parents were, could be characterized as domestic terrorists? And, and frankly, what was your reaction to, to all of that interaction? We didn't see that in Janesville. We saw people that were very concerned and very involved and perhaps a little bit emotional, but they never threatened us. They treated us with respect and that. And I know there were some that would like to maybe have done a little more, but didn't. And that, that I appreciate. It's like I said, we didn't go through what a lot of districts went through in that uh, as such. And that just reflects upon our citizens in Janesville that how good they are and that. Uh, and they have the right to do it. It doesn't mean that they didn't, they moved my emotions, but I couldn't show it. Some of them I felt sorry for. And some of them I thought, why are you going that extreme? I get your point. But they didn't treat us bad. And I think we learned some things from them, and we asked questions and that afterwards, uh, and that. So I think they're a positive force. They were not negative nor threatening. Have we always agreed on everything? You and I? Get away. <laughs> we haven't, have we? No. We haven't, right? No, we haven't. No, no. that's true. But we work together a lot, too. But I'm usually right, though, right? That's probably. We, we, we could probably go on in that debate for a long time. <laughs> he keeps handing me money under the table. <laughs> Again, the last series of questions were questions that came out of the audience, and we do welcome your questions. If you take the time to write them down on a slip of paper, we'll try and get them, fit them in to, uh, to the program this evening, uh, because we want to hear from you. Your, your voice is important. And I know the candidates uh, want to hear from you. So take a minute and write down your questions and turn them in. Going back to some of the prepared questions that, that we have, uh, I think that I'm going to start with you, Kevin, this time. Mm -hmm. The state school funding formula is based primarily on numbers of students in each district on a given day. You've got the, the fourth Friday count in September, and I think you do the repeat of that in January. Do you support or oppose basing school aids on measured academic performance, and why? That's an interesting question. I've never had to think about that one before. But when I think about getting funded by results, we, we kind of went through this a few years ago when we were redoing wage scales and we were going to 
tie teachers' wages to performance. And it didn't work out. Because, and I'm gonna stereotype, well, I don't even have to do that. We can have one school on one particular side of town that maybe is uh, have a, uh, a demographic where uh, there's not as much free and reduced lunch or poverty. And they may do better because of social economic uh, variables that maybe are a little more conducive to learning. But then you have another school with children that we all care for and want to succeed, but they have a whole different demographic of high poverty, uh, high uh, free and reduced lunch, different family dynamics, but nonetheless, each student in this community is given the same opportunity, and it's not an excuse to learn. But at one school, the test scores are gonna be complete, we're gonna be different than they are at the other school. So how do, how do you equate that? And um, if you wanna tie finances to growth, where you're not, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I'm Irish, so I can. <laughs> we, we, we can pause and move on to the next question and, and, and not dwell too deeply on the previous one. No red hair, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we may come back, Kevin, on that one. Carl, same question. The state yes. school funding formula is based primarily on numbers of students in each district on a given day. Uh, do you support or oppose basing school aids on measured academic performance, and why? Well, school aids aren't just on cuts in the seats. There are other factors that go into there. Uh, poverty levels, a variety of things, and that. But generally, butts in the seat is, is a big thing. Do I go for the idea that if they don't perform as well, they shouldn't get as much money? No, because that could mean that they need more money. In today's age of where we are large classrooms, we're short on aids, we don't have the money to fund them, where children need more individual care. Part of it comes from the home, where parents work two, three jobs, they can't put that individual care into the child or children they have, like we did, like our parents did, at least when I went to school and that. My mother was there, my father was there, they worked, they did their things, but they still took the time. They didn't have to fight through several jobs. So I don't want to penalize those particular children that don't do as well by taking away money, which just says they're going to do worse. Well, the next question I'm going to start with you, Carl, is how would you rewrite the school funding formula now that you've experienced the current funding formula's implications for several years. Uh, what would you change, if anything, and why? Frankly, they just need to go back to the table and redesign the whole system. And again, what would you change and why? Well, there's, there's things. Janesville has been very, very uh, conservative in their funding of the schools long before the state got tight-fisted in that. Uh, when I first came onto the board, I went through it. I had two years of open budget, and we sat and discussed how much can the people afford, how much can't they afford. We balanced it. Uh, for the previous, I was on a couple years, and then 10 years before that at least, the school district had taken and not taxed to the max. They had left over that 12 year period probably 12 to 14 million dollars on the table they could have taxed. When a certain person came into office, he froze stuff. So our conservatism and taking care of the children were frozen. Of course, that protected the state from having to pay for the children. And we had to throw it more onto the local taxpayer. Today, that's what we're doing with referendums, throwing it onto the taxpayer. We're not even keeping up with the cost of living. We're behind again. There are other areas that can be fixed, and that's a longer question than a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carl. Kevin, how would you rewrite the school funding formula now that you've 
had experience dealing with it and the implications for several years. What would you change, if anything, and why? Well, my first thought when you asked that question was, it's been like 15 years ago when Governor Doyle was here that he convened what they call the Blue Ribbon Consortium. And Tim Cohen was one of the leaders. And they went around the state with uh, <clears throat> representatives from both sides of the aisle and came up with a new plan. Yeah. And they couldn't agree, Madison. They shelved it, it's on a shelf somewhere. Um, so I, I, I really don't have the capacity to even understand the formula right now, let alone try to redesign it myself. All I know right now is if we want to maintain programming levels as it is today, assuming costs continue to go up and you factor in revenue limits, we can't do that without going to the public and asking for operational money through referendum. And that, that's different. Now, has that been good, good or bad? I, I don't know, to tell you the truth, because it's made us, the fact that we have to go ask for operational money has really made us look internally on how best to use the dollars we have. Thanks, Kevin. Next question comes from the audience, and we'll start with you, Kevin. How do you feel about the voucher system as a means to create competition and excellence in education and teaching? I, I asked for the data last week on how much the current budget uh, reflects on what we pay to voucher schools in the state. Um, this current budget year is just over $800,000. That could be our usable money here in the district. And it's just not this district. Every district, part of their funding goes into the voucher program. But it started off as a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, five <laughs> years ago. Now it's, it's approaching a million dollars. Um, you know, I have uh, a grandchild that goes to St. John Vianney, and uh, his parents chose to do that. It's a great education, but they chose to do that. And the school district does supply services to parochial schools, pr primarily in remedial reading and math and some special needs. So I guess to be honest, um, I'm, I'm not uh, in, in favor of using uh, public school money for private schools. Thank you. Carl, how do you feel about the voucher system as a way to create competition and excellence in academics and teaching? Well, I'll, I'll kind of set up a little bit. Our daughter went to St. John's Vianney. And there was a reason, it wasn't the academics in the school, it was another reason. And it worked out very fine in that. Uh, the problem with the two is, number one, they're taking up our top. Whereas the parochial schools, and I'll defend, I don't know of any parochial school in Janesville, well, there's one, but the Catholic and the Lutheran do not get voucher money. This is, uh, a certain school is getting a lot of it. They can charge whatever they want, all they want, anything they want, and then take the money on top of it. We can't charge. We have to have this amount of money, and then they take part of our money on top. It's not right. It's not right whatsoever. And the schools aren't necessarily asking for it, the parochial. That. So I'm totally against it. It also creates other problems uh, there. You, you start just teaching differently to try to keep up with this one or that one. 
and the parochial schools are not necessarily that much better than the public schools, and some of them even around the area are not doing as well. So that money is not well spent. It's just money taken away from public schools, which is dictated or set up. Okay, thank you. This next question from the audience, I'll, again, I'll try to paraphrase and, and, and bring it uh, down into manageable form, has to do with how representation is accomplished within the school board. You nine members are elected at large within the community currently. This questioner is wondering if there could be a system where you would apportion representation out. Could, for example, two board members be elected from each of our four neighborhoods, east side, west side, south side, uh, and the historic issue. Uh, could there be a representative that would be named or appointed uh, to represent each of the schools from the PTA? Or conversely, could there be one or two persons uh, representing the PTA? Essentially, how do you, the bottom line is, how do you feel about the current structure, how, how, how you are elected at large to represent the community as a whole versus some type of apportioned representation? Well, it would be hard to do. Uh, I was on the state board, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, and I'm very familiar with uh, boards across the state. Other than some rural districts in the nor northern part of the state uh, where they want to make sure each community gets someone, they're small communities of a few hundred people, but they might have eight communities together. So they, they, it works there. But I don't know of any district that does it, and I'm not sure we gain anything by it, because, well, I don't, I don't want to. I've thought of it many times. It's just like, should, why shouldn't the city council have nine members like we do, and then every three years on it, instead of having to take money and spend it and fight for a re-election every two years, they could be like us every three years. So I think about those things in government, but I don't see any real reason to change the formula. Uh, but I'd be willing to listen if anybody came up with a good reason and that. Uh, maybe east, south, west, two from each one and one at large. I don't know. But I've never thought of it. So bring it to me and I'll listen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start, I guess, this, this or Kevin, the same question. How would you it, it goes to a portion representation. It, 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 it's a, a representative based upon neighborhood scheme versus representation of city at large. Um, speak to that, please. Well, I'm thinking, uh, I've heard this question posed in the, our community for numbers of years. Do we want a mayor? Do we want a city manager? Do we have aldermen? How do we maintain and have equal representation? from all parts of the community. I think it's a little different with school boards <coughs> because I know at one time we were strapped and we were thinking about closing a school. It's probably been 10 years ago maybe. Mm -hmm. And the community said, no, we value our community neighborhood schools. And I think as it relates to the school board, that's the value of equal representation. So if you have a school like Lincoln down on the, on the south side, you have staff, principals, counselors and such that are directly connected to those students and there's a great conduit for that, that neighborhood and that community to tie into the school district. Now, Right now, I think the majority of the school board members live on the east side of town. And if you draw a conclusion that that makes us ineffective, I, I don't see anything or experience or data or anybody that can show us that we don't function appropriately with all different types of people in this community, depending on where they live. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. And as an aside, uh, the way the question was posed, it was representation from the east side, the west side, the south side, and the historic hub. And I wanted to make that correction. I also wanted to note that being a north sider, 
my neighborhood is rarely if ever mentioned in these in these representative <laughs> schemes. So there is a north side in Janesville. Thank you. How would you recommend or guide staff to handle transgender requests for use of gender specific restrooms and locker rooms, Kevin? I was uh, where was I? I was at Monroe School on Friday. I had an opportunity to substitute teach for a fifth grade class, and um, which is a whole new story. Um, so I'm walking down the hallway with a couple of the students, give them to music class. Ah, and there's a gender neutral bathroom. So in Janesville, we accommodate anyone, any person that way. There's gender neutral facilities. To be honest with you, I'm not sure, exactly sure how it works in Fayette, and I should know that, but I don't. But we, we accommodate every individual for what they need to be a successful student in this district. Uh, Carl, same question to you. How would you recommend or guide staff to handle transgender requests for use of specific gender-specific restrooms or locker rooms? Well, the administration does a good job, and as Kevin said, uh, you can go to any school and you'll find a, a male, female, and a gender neutral to go to. It doesn't create controversy at all. The children don't have a problem with it and that who will have a problem are parents. They don't like it. And I've heard a couple complaints from parents that the children do well, they make do, they're, they're a different generation than we were, and I think we have to start, we have to accept those things. Uh, I think the administration's done a good job adapting to that, and I think it will continue to do that. If things change or anything, They'll look at it and make necessary adjustments. And I support them in it. Thank you. Thank you. Another question from the audience, and we'll start with you, Carl. Should the extreme cost of sports be covered by professional sports entities instead of being part of the educational system? And is school sports the reason that educational system, the educational system is so expensive and puts uh, a challenge on uh, costs related to academics. I think Kevin's probably better at it than I am, but I'll tell you what I know about it. Uh, a lot of our sports don't cost extra. They're covered by contributions and friends of groups that pay for all these extras and that. Uh, do they cover everything? Do we spend some? I don't know. Many, many years ago, uh, we've always paid for the healthiness of physical education and sports. The competitiveness, being able to get together with other communities, and that, other than maybe we had a little trouble with Beloit, but they had trouble with us. So, so uh, that, but no, I don't, I, don't I it doesn't cost much to do these things. It's actually a very good game. Uh, it's a better environment for children to learn in. Uh, I think, that's looking for something that doesn't exist, although they may not be aware of how much money is contributed to make sure these sports are able to function in a safe and proper manner. Okay, thank you, Carl. Kevin, same question. Should the extreme cost of sports be covered by professional sports entities instead of being part of the educational system expenses? And uh, are, are school sports one of the reasons why the educational system is so expensive and there's this, a drain on academics as a result. Is that a premise you agree with? Um, I happen to be an advocate for athletics. Um, most of us have read that just like the arts, um, athletics contributes to the uh, holistic growth of our students. It, it um, not just the physical part, but, te but teamwork, responsibility, winning, losing, and on and on. But I, I would guess that um, our athletes are some of the most successful students academically as well. 
Um, I, in my opinion, Janesville values athletics. And at the school, I'm trying to, best of my knowledge, I, I, I believe our, our, our budget for athletics is over a million dollars. And that includes all the, all the things, maintaining the facilities, coaching, uh, transportation is a huge part of athletics, getting the bus here and there. Um, so I do not think it's a drain on the budget. I think it adds to our value of our schools. If you go down to Monterey Stadium and watch the Parker Craig football game, the Battle for the Rock, the place is packed by community members. Thank you, Kevin. In the remaining time that we have, I'm going to give each of you the opportunity to make some closing comments. Uh, any thoughts that you want to share that we perhaps haven't covered by the questions tonight? We'll make that last minute appeal to the uh, to the audience uh, concerning why you are a candidate again to be a member of the Board of Trustees with the Janesville School District. And I think I'm going to do this. I'll open it up with uh, Kevin. You, you can have the first oh. shot. All right. Well, thanks again for everybody being here and for taping this so people can revisit who the heck we are. Um, I'm finishing my 18th year on the board, and uh, I'm real grateful for it. I've learned a lot, and um, I'm continuing to grow as, a, as, a, as an individual. I actually think I'm a better husband for it. Maybe because I'm not as home as much. <laughs> but I, um, I, what I wouldn't wish is that um, people would communicate with me more mm -hmm. about anything. I do uh, once or twice a month have a get a phone call. And for example, I had a volunteer coach say, hey, Kevin, I'm arriving early. I'm a volunteer, and I can't get a key fob to get the kids in the door. Oh. Well, OK, let's, let's take care of that. And a simple things like that that have a big impact on the students in our, in our community. So I, I wish I would get more of feedback, consistent feedback on what people are thinking. Because we just don't get a lot. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Kevin. Carl, uh, Commerce Housing, you have the same opportunity. Any closing thoughts or suggestions, ideas that you want to share with our audience? Well, I'm not as old as Kevin, so I've only got 12 years on the board finishing up. You're uh, older, though. Technicality. <laughs> and that. Uh, I tend to agree. I don't think people do communicate to us as much as we would like them to. That's how we make our decisions and we listen. We may not agree with them all the time. Sometimes we do and we do more research behind it. I just had a phone call from a guy out of state today and that uh, asked me a question. I won't go into what it was about and that. And I said I'd follow up on it. This happens and that uh, it's for a grandchild. So, you know, it's that type of thing. But we do, we're willing to do that. Um, sometimes you wonder uh, why people don't. We don't bite. We usually listen. We're not mean. And we just try to be good, good trustees of the, the school district, because that's what we are, trustees and that. And as commissioners and that, as such, uh, I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of it. And as long as I can continue to go, I will try to keep going as long as I'm doing the right thing. So we'll work at that uh, moment. Uh, we've had Dwayne on the board. We've had a lot of other people on the board who have done a wonderful job, and we appreciated it. Thank you, Carl. Kevin Murray, Carl Dommershausen, thank you very much for being here You're this welcome. evening. Uh, there'll be a number of opportunities between now and the election day in April for you to visit with the candidates, get a chance to ask your questions of them and, and help them do the job that they're attempting to do. Um, again, thank you.
very, very much for your participation and, and best of luck to both of you going forward. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, this will be replayed uh, beginning early next week on JATV channel 994, as well as being available on YouTube. Uh, so I would hope that uh, between now and the election, you take some time to get to know your, your, your school board trustees and, and, and uh, quiz them in person. And I know they'll be sticking around this evening for a few minutes to, to meet with you personally if, if you have that, uh, have that desire. So again, thank you and, and good night. Just bring forward.